Hello everyone, Kent Bressler here. I want to welcome you to Kent's Kidney Stories. During our time together um, over these podcasts, I'd like to uh, discuss kidney disease. I'd like to tell you about my journey as a transplant patient, but also talk about dialysis, kidney donation, and just about anything else that might be of interest. Kent's Kidney Stories podcast endorsed and sponsored by kidneysolutions.org. Hello everyone, this is Kent Bressler, uh, Kidney Solutions, and we're going to do a podcast again this today, and uh, I've got a, a, a really great guest that I'll tell you a little bit about, and then we're gonna get right down to the nitty gritty and start talking about kidney disease. Because I want you to be informed and during this period of time, what this is being recorded is during the uh, coronavirus. So you you can understand that everybody's pretty well penned up and uptight, and I understand that. But we're gonna work through this. We're gonna, we're gonna do fine. The point here is, is that I have a friend that I want you to meet, and she's a great friend, and she's an author, and I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Let's pray. Father, I'm tempted to worry about so many things. Our world is a mess. Forgive me for focusing on anything or anyone but you. Thank you for the scriptures that equips and empowers me to live each day. Right now, I declare that you are my only hope. Please help me remember that you really are in control. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. I met this gal at an... AAKP meeting at one point in time. It's been a year or so ago, and I don't even remember what meeting it was, but she, she sat right next to me in the auditorium, and uh, during a conversation, I come to find out that she was a, a hero. I didn't realize it, but yet she was. She, she donated a kidney to her sister, and the result of that donation was a story about an entire family, not just about Suzanne Ruff, but about her entire family. And she wrote a book about it. And I've read this book, and I've encouraged others to read it. And it's uh, she'll tell you all about it. But uh, I want to I want to introduce you to Suzanne Ruff. She's the author of The Reluctant Donor and a really good friend of mine. So Suzanne. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Kent. I'm delighted to be here. I enjoyed we, uh, the beautiful opening prayer. <laughs> Thank you. You know, uh, when I read this book, I thought to myself, gee whiz, I'm, I've known people with PKD, you know, polycystic kidney disease, many of them, all right, in my, my journey. Yours was kind of unique because you put it in a perspective that people could understand. You say, well, yeah, I got PKD and I had to give my sister a kidney. That's not the whole whole business. It goes way back in, in, in your family tree. And it's been devastating for your family. All right. And that really made it cut a note with me. It really made me feel good about knowing you. And that's why I wanted you to share this story with uh, with my listeners. Now, there may only be one out there, maybe seven. I don't know how many people are listening. But if we touch somebody with your story, then we've done our job and it, it'll be a blessing and it'll be a blessing to that one or the several that hear it. So first of all, welcome. Second of all, tell me your story. Well, thank you, Kent. I, I think that the fact that you noticed that the disease ravaged our family, put the hereditary part of PKD in perspective. 
And although it is about PKD and what it's done to our family, anyone with kidney disease should be aware of how far we have come in the treatment of kidney disease over the past 70 years that I traced our story, my family's story to. So I, I, I'm glad that you noticed the hereditary part of it and knowing how far back my family battled kidney disease, whether it's polycystic kidney or FSGS or uh, the, any other form of kidney disease, you can follow it through the book, the, the progress we've made in the treatment of kidney disease. And I really so and truly didn't expect the book to be, I did, I, I wrote, started writing the book for my niece, who I didn't, who I wanted her to know she has the disease. And at the time that that I was writing the book, we didn't know she had polycystic kidney disease, but she had a 50% chance of having it. And I knew that. And so I wrote it so she would never forget how far we've come. I, I really didn't plan on publishing it. Well, we were, we lucked out because it's fantastic. I mean, I've read it twice. And I probably, if I was, uh, if it wasn't so elderly and slow and slow, I probably have read it two or three more times. The point here, the point here is, you know, you're the only one, right, in in their family circle that didn't have the disease. Now, how many people were in your family? Oh, it's Irish Catholic family, Kent. There's so many. <laughs> yeah. We just multiply like rabbits. So the the. <laughs> The, there's, I mean, I, I had 30, I think I have 32 first cousins and um, it, w it was a truly a magnificent family to grow up in. And there was a point in time where when we finally realized it was uh, hereditary was in the probably the early 1960s, maybe in. Oh, is, wow. Yeah, it was. Um, it didn't, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that, oh, if uh, Uncle Bill had it and Uncle Jack had it and my grandmother had it, uh-oh, what is, there's a little, you know, connect the dots there. But yeah. uh, so, so the family, right as of today, in, in our family, we have had nine transplants. Nine. Nine. I mean, nine is a lot, a big number. And oh when you, my there's goodness. a waiting list of how many over a hundred thousand for. A, yeah. Yeah. Kidneys, 90 some thousand. Yeah. But nine but, just in your immediate family. Yes. But what I most tell people is the beginning of our story begins. I always say with before I was born and that's because I was named after a grandmother I never met and her kidneys began to fail in the 1940s. Now she had three sons that fought in World War II. And around the time of World War II, when my kid, grandmother's kidneys were beginning to fail, a doctor in Germany was experimenting with a washing machine, a hose, and orange juice cans. And that's what he invented the first dialysis machine. First dialysis machine. She. So that was around the same time my grandmother's kidneys were failing. I, I, I always, when I read something or he, or learn something, I always try to put it in context to what was happening in my life or yep. in my mother's life or, or my father's life. Just to, that's how I, I guess, how my little brain thinks. So at that time, my grandmother had these three sons fighting in World War II. Her kidneys were beginning to fail. That doctor had to escape to the Netherlands in order to continue his, his invention of that dialysis machine. And he began to do that because he had a 19-year-old patient whose kidneys were failing. And he was so wow. frustrated. And I always think about how my grandmother, who was known for her gracious 
dinner parties and her entertaining. She was a social person, well loved. She was president of the of the Catholic Boys High School Mothers Club, and she just was a very um, prayerful woman. I I learned I never met her, but I learned she loved to shop, but she was active in her church, and she loved her family and my mother was the youngest and my mother's death birth almost killed my grandmother apparently because my grandmother had bad kidneys but at then they didn't know anyway my grandmother was told that the, there was in the late 1940s after her sons came back from world war ii thankfully that her kidneys were failing and that there was nothing nothing yeah. doctors yeah. could do and that's what started all this, the writing. Well, if you read the book and you read it carefully, first you kind of like read it and just get through it to see. And then when you go back and read it, you start picking up some things, right? And one of the things I noticed was your demeanor with your sister, how you and your sister, you eventually gave her a kidney. Is that correct? You mean the sister I didn't like too much? That's the one. <laughs> How did you know what I was thinking? Yeah, you didn't like her very much, right? So tell me about that. Well, if, if I always, if I'm giving a speech, ask everybody if they have a sibling. And if they have a sibling, I ask them if they've ever, ever once had a argument or a disagreement or a fight with their sister, with their sibling to raise their hand. And almost everybody in the audience raises their hand. Yeah. But it wasn't so much that I didn't like my sister. It was just what happens was as siblings become adults, you go your separate ways. You develop different ways of thinking. And we had grown apart. And But what I realized that it wasn't so much that I... I, I really had to look at myself. I thought I didn't like her. And when I when she collapsed in renal failure, I realized how much I loved her. Ah. And that was key to looking very closely at my judgmental self. So I realized that maybe we didn't agree on many things. Uh, and, and a perfect example of it is when we the two of us do math she might add um six and five to get 11 and i'll add nine and two to get 11. we just we get the same answer but we do right. and that's how we sort of go through life and but i realized that didn't make make that didn't there's nothing wrong with her or with me we just weren't agreeing on certain things but when you scraped it all away deep down i loved her yeah yeah did how long did you okay tell me tell me how many it just your brothers and sisters you were the only one how many other brothers and sisters did you have that had transplant because i think she was she the last one that got transplanted yes she okay. I have two sisters and no brothers. Okay. So my, both of my sisters inherited the disease. Okay. Uh, I have uh, right now though, I have um, in one, my mother's sister had eight children and there's four boys who all have polycystic kidney disease. That's so that, and, and we're all close. So sure, that, sure. That, they're like brothers, I guess you'd say, but sure. yeah. My sisters, um, my my youngest sister had polycystic kidney disease, and of course my mother did too. But my sister, who I gave the kidney to, um, see, well, that there's another twist to our story. Our parents, when they realized it was a hereditary disease, had us all tested, and there were four of us that were tested, and three out of the four had polycystic kidney disease. But they lied to us and told us none of us had the disease. And I really and truly think that it was my father's way of coping with 
He thought he was protecting us. We were teenagers. Sure, sure. It, it's been a, there, there's um like in every family, there's all the twists and turns of yeah. deceit. And one person thinks it's deceit. One person thinks it's uh, irresponsible. Okay. Yeah. Right. But, uh, and that, it, by the way, in a polycystic kidney disease family is a huge controversy that is going on today. Do you test a child uh, or not? Right. Do you test a child the results or not? My parents chose not to tell us the results. And um, there was anger. There was bitterness and then there was forgiveness he just tried to do what was right what he thought was right sure sure and and i think if you really now if you could go back on it and if you have reflected on it it was really out of love because he he loved you so much and especially he knew that you were the one that didn't have it well i think i I would, I don't know. I really don't. I, yeah. I, my mother died before my sister collapsed in renal failure. And that's what happened. My sister that I didn't like <laughs> collapsed, <laughs> in, co collapsed in renal failure. And I received a telephone call saying she was in critical condition in the hospital and that she wanted to talk to me. And I picked up the phone and called her. And it was my, my other sister that called to tell me that. And yeah. she, she has PKD, my other sister, yeah. who said, how could I not know that she had PKD? And so when I did call her in the hospital, she, um, I said, she wants to talk. My sister said, she wants to talk to you. You need to call her. I called her right away. And I said, the first thing that came out of my mouth was, I, I will give you one one of my kidneys. And then the minute I said it, I thought, oh my goodness, what did I just say? I can't do that. I can't give her a kidney. I'm, I'm a coward. I'm a chicken. And, um, and as soon as said, Joanne, I'll give you one of my kidneys. She said, oh, you're a chicken. You know what? And she yeah. said, you will, you will not give me one, my kid, your kidneys. You need to get tested. That was what she wanted to talk to me about. She yeah. said, if I have it, you might have it. She and, called you, she, or she, she she really wanted you not to be a donor. She wanted to say, you need to check and make sure you don't have it. That's yeah. the point. <clears throat> That's and interesting. I, yeah. And, and to be honest with you, I have to say that I didn't even, I really didn't think about myself. I just thought, oh my goodness, she's in renal failure. She needs a kidney. I, 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 I felt like. I should do it. And I said to her, I will give you a kidney. And then she said, no, you won't. You're a chicken. You know what? And then she <laughs> said, and you have, and you need to get tested immediately. <laughs> to see. And I remember it was, um, a d I was living in Minnesota at the time and it was snowing. I hung up the phone and I went and got my gym bag and I went right straight to the indoor pool. I, I like to swim. And I went in, in the middle of the day, I went over to the pool and I went swimming. And I went, I was swimming thinking, and I like to pray when I swim. And yeah. I was thinking, oh my gosh, I, what if I have it? You know, but then I remember thinking, no, I, I, I'm supposed to give her a kidney. I felt like God wanted me to do that. And I, it, I knew that's what I was supposed to do. So when I got done swimming, I went, I called her back and I said, no, I, I'll get tested, but I, I will give you one of my kidneys because I really felt like I, I always joke and say, nobody walked on water in that swimming pool and nobody appeared to me in that swimming pool, but something happened in that swimming pool. I knew that I was supposed to give her one of my kidneys. Even though after I said it, I wished a million times I didn't say it. And I kept thinking, I can't do this. I don't think I can do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. I drove my poor husband insane. 
I don't maybe maybe you, more, you drove him more crazy, not not insane, just more crazy, right? So I wanted to I wanted to <laughs> I get a kick out of you so much. Anyway, I wanted to read a couple things in the book. I want uh, passages and that stood out to me. Okay, one of them was your relationship, but this was in your developmental days when you were early, early on and, and you were real young. And I wanted you to comment on it. So I'll try to hope, hopefully everybody will get the gist here. Uh, I'm afraid I will find, this is your mother talking and she says, you know, Suzanne, I'm afraid I'll find you by a stop sign someday and you'll be there waiting for it to say go. And uh, she used to shake her head at me and because I was very rigid. And uh, Susie, she said, was it comfortable for your heels to be together? You were asked in a, in a play to put your heels together for a portrait. And her mom asked you how comfortable that was. And and you shook your set, head and said, no, it wasn't comfortable, you know, it wasn't, right? And then she said to you, trust yourself, honey. Think for yourself. You're a smart little cookie. Always trust your gut. God will guide you. Hell, when the nuns told me something wasn't allowed, Susie, I immediately thought, hmm, I'm going to do that the first chance I get. Now, I'm not stupid. I wouldn't go and jump off a 10-foot building, but some things, well, you'll know when I'm you'll know what I mean when you come to one of them. Talk to God. He will guide you. I thought that that really that was really some sage information coming from someone who really knew you, right? No one knows you like your mother, right? That's right. That's right. And she said to you, she said to you, Susie, Susie, you have to think for yourself. And that's really what you were going through when you were thinking about giving that kidney. She was right. You had to think for yourself. It was your decision, yours alone. You're gonna make me cry, Kent. Um, I hope. I hope so. Do you know my, why? Because my mother, I wrote that I would not have been able to give anybody a kidney if it hadn't been for those who went before me. My my mother, my aunts, my uncles, and all of them are where we are today in the treatment of kidney disease, in the manner that we have transplantation, in the drugs that all of the transplant recipients take. Uh, each one of them, my, my Uncle Bill was instrumental in, he was the first transplant recipient in the family. Uh, he was told there was a risk with the anti-rejection drugs. He took the risk, but that risk helped all of us who are recipients today. Or, um, But my mother and her beautiful faith and her incredible sense of humor. I mean, she used to say, Susie, God has a great sense of humor. I mean, look around, look at all the people he made. I mean, she just was, she just yeah. was, she just would say, the funniest things, and she always talked about God in a way that, and I'm Catholic, Roman Catholic, Irish Roman Catholic, right? Yeah. And I, I know there are troubles within the Catholic Church that are abominable. But I also know my mother used to say, the church is run by men, and men not 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 she didn't mean males just people the, yes you we said are that all book. right and and we are all nobody is perfect my husband has a great saying the only person he knew that was perfect was crucified so right exactly exactly so, I, I, I mean no none of us are perfect and my mother would say our faith was very important. The Catholic Church was a part of my life. I say my rosary every day, especially during this pandemic. Yes. I never 
Uh, but she would, all of us have to think for ourselves, and every one of us has that little feeling deep down inside of us that tells us what's right and what's wrong. Yes, that's true. There's one statement that you actually almost read from the book, and you're doing it from your memory and your heart. And it says here, don't get so hung up on the rules that you don't see the beauty in God's message. Ooh, and that's I what I think. <laughs> yeah, it's what you said. It's got right, it's right here in this book. <laughs> so the, the, I guess my point is, and you mentioned it too, about judgmental, being judgmental, or, you know, there is such a thing as judge. Judgmentalism is a sin, you know, it's a respectable sin, if you will. And one of the things that you talk about with respectable sin and during, during being judgmental is that's you doing it to somebody else. Oh, to judge another is to judge the face of God. Exactly. And that in, that in was a very good statement from you early on about judging. You know, really, when, when, you, when you think about judging, let's not do it. It's a sin. Okay. And if you really do are... are in your heart, you are blessed with the Holy Spirit. You need to just, if you are that way, and to have you go through this whole thing, this whole process, you give yourself, your daughter, your sister a kidney, that meaning is that that came directly from you and God, right? Oh, he was right so there. So this wasn't about you, it was about God. And that's not lost on me, and thank God it's not lost on you. Um, I just, how, how is your sister doing? Well, I was going to tell you that it's 15 years post-transplant. 15 and, years. Yes, and she is doing great, and she is, um, it, it's a gift to have given her, to watch her, take such good care of the gift she nicknamed we all name our transplanted kidneys so um her hers is called little susie little and susie take, yes and she tries <laughs> she has always been my sister has always been a picky eater I, I eat anything and everything and she is always one that goes ew i don't like that ew i don't like that well so when i get when i stumbled down to her hospital room after the transplant she was so um i get choked up she was so full of gratitude and she kept saying i'm going to take such good care of this of little susie i'm going to eat just like you i'm going to do all the things you do and i'll take good care of it which was which was wonderful but the funniest yeah. part is i love blueberries and she i i, I mean i love them and she said i will even eat blueberries so now when blueberry season is in she'll buy blueberries and she takes them like a pill and she <laughs> like she doesn't eat them she takes them just like swallows them i think that's fun. it is it is you pick up the quirks they say i don't know i i remember i remember the i think it was the second day you know back when when i was transplanted my donor, my brother, they had to do a, a, a ventral incision. They and they took one and a half ribs out just to get the kidney out. Now they do it laparoscopically. And I can remember, uh, it was, I believe it was the second day, and uh, they they had us separated. He was on one end of the hall, and I was on the other end of the hall. So he navigated on his first walk, and second walk somewhere. He came in the room and he looked straight at me in the bed, and he said, "What the hell did you get me into?" <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah, Very that's exactly. So, you know, this donut donor business, it is not easy. Well, I I, I, have, I would Go ahead. If if I I don't I would not be talking to you probably if I had if I had to do it the way your brother had to do it. And those are the true heroes. Um that is that was quite a surgery. Oh. And it, it was different for me. And, and I, I know everything I have a, I like to say everything is as it should be, but I, I don't 
and who knows? I, I just know that getting through the laparoscopic surgery well, for me was overwhelming. Difficult. I, oh, I mean, yeah. just just terrifying. I had never ever had surgery, um, oh. and never, you know, I had two children, so I was in the hospital before. Yeah, but those are the true heroes, the early people that donated. But, you know, uh, I don't want to dwell on my, my story, but in, within your story, you have to look at yourself. You have to be very respectful of what you did, not because it was difficult or it was what you thought you had to do, but you did it, right? There are some in the world who refuse to do that because it may jeopardize their health and they don't want to do it. Oh, you We should. know the donor. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. The, 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 the comments that people make are, and they don't do it out of, um, I don't think meanness or spite. They just do it out of, I guess, ignorance. You, they just don't understand. Uh, I and some, yeah. Or they, I they really believe. Uh, I, I had one, one pers person said to me, um, I wouldn't give, give it to a, sibling but i would to my child and yeah. I, you know it it just depends on everyone i i am serious i would not be talking to you if it hadn't been for what if i hadn't grown up in a family devastated by kidney disease oh i'm sure I, i'm sure of it and, and to have to to work through that is one thing but to survive it and look back at it you know, you do, you have to look back. We say, you know, you, you look back on to learn from things and today you live and you dream of the future. But you did a, a fantastic thing for your sister. But you, I, what I've always said, would that be turned around? Would your sister have done that for you? I think so. Um, the, I, I get asked that question often and we, we it's it always reminds me of there's a prayer by um mother teresa and it's about how if you build people will tear down and it says build anyway if you yes. if you um do all this it doesn't matter it wasn't between you and them anyway it was between you and god so in for me i i always say I don't want to think about it. Um, we weren't getting along at the time. So I don't know if she would or wouldn't uh, have. And it's not, it doesn't matter anyway. I guess that's how I handle that one. You did, yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're not struggling. There's no need to struggle about it. It's a done deal. But I always think of myself when I say, I got, you know, I've got my brother's kidney. Is that really his kidney or is it mine? Now, I've talked about this before that, you know, it still is, no matter how you look at it. He's not getting it back, of course, but. <laughs> That's so funny because my sister will um, sit next to me and she'll say, you're not getting it back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well. But, you know, I, I wrote a letter to my kidney the night before surgery. Did you? I, I didn't put it in the book because I already looked like a, a nutcase anyway in the book. So I just felt like it would make me look even crazier. And I still have the letter. And I wrote to my kidney and I said, I'm not giving you away. I'm honoring you. Because, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was a gift from God, my kidney. And I was trying to tell my little kidney that I didn't want it to feel, I wanted it to work. So I yes, yes. I didn't I didn't want the little kid little guy to think I was rejecting him. I was honoring him. Yep. Her, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. It. <laughs> yep. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation and we we could probably go on like you and I talked the other day forever because we both like to talk. <laughs> and that's good for me because if I don't Wow, I have a hard time. I do want to, you are actually working uh, on articles for a paper. What paper is it that you that you uh, write your articles for? 
well, I North, North Carolina. Yeah, the Charlotte Observer was my freelance. It sort of slowed down with the way the newspaper business is going. Well, yeah, that's the other thing I wanted to close with. You, how are you holding up? And do you have any suggestions for those who are listening to get through what we're going through now with this virus? We've talked about you know you know just. Give me a short synopsis of what, how you feel, how you're making it, and do you have any suggestion for others? I have two cousins on dialysis right now. My heart and my prayers are with all of the dialysis patients, transplant recipients, all of the high risk, all of, I, I hope that everyone is staying home and not taking any chances. And how I'm getting through it is faith. I, I had a few nights of not being able to sleep. And I know that it's not just me. Uh, uh, friends that, and not kidney patients, my daughter, uh, all of us are. I don't think it's coincidental that it's Lent that this is happening. I, I really and truly do not. I think it is a time for us to reflect I, I, my husband feels strongly about the fact that, and he does, my husband does not like to talk about his religion or his prayers. I do all the time. I'm Irish, but he doesn't. Um, but he's even saying that he thinks this is definitely time for all of us. We are supposed to bring, bring God back into our world. I couldn't agree more. And I, as I, I, Hope that people who are listening understand that this is not a poo-poo incident. We really take this serious. Being in the kidney world, I don't listen to all the hype, if you want to call it that, but I know what I'm responsible for myself to take care of myself. It doesn't mean any more than what I was doing for the last 30 years. It's just an alertness or a heightening of my sensorium, being able to put it all in perspective, in other words, say, Kent, you are responsible for yourself right now, even more so. That means that you continue to do as directed and you follow closely what the recommendations are. Don't think about the money. Don't think about the job. Don't think about anything other than taking care of yourself and making sure that you, you stay healthy. Do your walking. Take your medicines. If you have a fever, notify somebody. If you get achy, if you have any symptoms that you even think, call and follow up on them. Don't stay at home thinking, well, you know, golly, it'll go away. Because this stuff doesn't go away. It's dangerous. And I want to tell you, the most important thing for you to do right now is be your best advocate. Be conscious about what you and your surroundings, what you're doing. Take care of yourself. Wash your hands. Sneeze into your arm. All the little basic things, but most of all, keep your distance. This is going to pass. This is going to pass. And it's going to be a difference. There's, this is not going, we're not going to have the same as it was. It's gonna, not going to be normal. All right. The new normal is what we'll live by, not what we thought we were going to live by. We're not returning to the way it was. If you think that, you might want to reflect. All right. Suzanne, I want to tell you, you're a very close friend of mine and you've made a good friend with Jason. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know, I hope and pray that you take really good care of yourself. And I wish and hope the best for your family. Thank you, Kent. You All know, right. what I like to say is pray hard when it's hardest to pray. Yeah, pray hard when it's hardest to pray. Okay, folks. Time's up. Remember, as I always say, take care of yourself and keep breathing.